Well, if you're with us for the first time, we are in part two of a three-part series called Gone Fishing and talking to our church about fishing. And I shared last week, not fishing like you think, but I shared last week uh, all of my uh, horrible fishing stories. So if you want to hear them, you're going to have to go to our website and check them out. But um, the reason why we're doing this se- se- uh, series, and my hope is that you'll begin to understand and remember our mission as the church what our mission is as the church, why we exist as a church. It's not so that we can just have good get-together as a family. Those are, that's nice. Not so that we can just come together and worship the Lord. That's good. Not so that we can just have small groups and appreciate each other and love each other. That's all good, but it's not really the real mission. We have to remember what, that God commanded us to go. Go into all the nation. That's what God commanded us to do. And so every now and then, folks, in church, because it's really easy for us to sit down and enjoy the worship and enjoy the word and be comfortable. It's really easy for us to slip into that area of contentment in our lives and forget what we're called to do. And so I hope you've had the opportunity this week to invite someone to church or at least begin the conversation with somebody that needs to know about Jesus. Amen? So don't delay. Remember, remember this followers fish, followers of Christ. They fish. It's a command. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot pick and choose what we want to obey out of the word of God. There's a lot of us like that, which is why we don't always see everybody sometimes or whatever. We want to pick and choose what we obey out of the word of God. You can't. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you must obey the whole word. I know this. Not very popular, but that's the truth. Amen. So here's our base scripture. It's what we use. It's what we started with last week. It's Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. If you want to take notes, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures today. I'm going to share with you where we're going. So last week, what I did is we laid the foundation of why. We, I shared with you biblical principles, why it's not an option, why this is what we do. Today, I'm going to be a little bit more practical with you. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting the net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. I believe as, as, as believers, we have to understand what Jesus was implying, what he was saying here. Because here he is, he's starting the beginning of his earthly ministry. He's looking for some guys that he can call disciples that together they're going to flip the entire world upside down. And it's interesting to me that sometimes what happens is we get this little term, follow me and I'll make you. We get it confused sometimes. Because a lot of times in the Christian world, especially when we're going through a tough time, we think that Jesus was saying, follow me and I'll make all your problems go away. We think that Jesus is saying, follow me and I'm going to make you holy and righteous and super spiritual. We think that Jesus is saying, follow me and I'll make your wife like you again. No, that's your own problem. He said, he didn't, and we think he said, follow me and I'll make you rich. Right? That's not what he said. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It's the very first thing that Jesus said to them. And it's interesting to me that, you know, in the interview process, what he was he interviewing the disciples, he didn't ask them about their educational experience, their background, their qualifications, their skills. He basically said to them, if you follow me, this is what I'm going to turn you into. And you know what they did? They dropped everything and went with him. And what's amazing is that these men have never fished for men. Their whole life, they have fished fish. So there he's asking them to do something that to them seems a little impossible because they've never done it. But here they they believe him so much. They say, you know what? Okay, we've never done it, but we're going to do it. But here's the kicker. If the very first thing that Jesus wanted his disciples to do was to fish men, That was high on his priority. He didn't tell him, follow me because I need a secretary. Follow me because I need a band. No, he said, follow me. If this was the very first thing on Jesus' list, what makes us think it's not on his priority anymore? If my Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, do you not think that fishing for men is still high on his priority? But what happens as the church, folks, we get, we get together, we become this big social group, and we get comfortable, and we love each other, and that's great. And we forget what we're called to do. It's fish men. We're supposed to fish them. And they, look, we don't, look, folks, you don't have to look that far to see that our world is falling apart. You turn the news on, you, 
Does it's com- the communities are falling apart. All this hate and confusion. The twisting of God's word for the sake of doing something righteous. Right? We got this going on in our communities. People don't know what to believe anymore. And to think, to think we think that our president and congressmen are going to change the situation. Or we think that if we just simply blame them, it will change the situation. Guess what? Racism has been in existence since the fall of man. It's been in, since the fall of man. And no man has ever been able to change it. Now, God throughout the years have had men and women who have done something to advance his cause against it. But it's not. It's, listen, Jesus is the answer. But get this. He sees his word the church. We get a little messed up. Jesus is the answer. We know Jesus is the answer. But the means or the vehicle that Jesus uses is the church. And unless the church does their job to be the salt and the light of the world, nothing will ever change. So instead of shifting blame and getting on Facebook and saying all this nonsense, maybe we ought to get together and get on our knees and reach out and hug a brother that doesn't look like you and love somebody. You want to know the ministry of love and reconciliation? God gave it to you and me, the church. It's ours. So we got to rise up. So when we hear something, we rise up. We bring healing. We rise up. People are going to hate. People are going to hit. So what? We rise up with love and reconciliation. Because that's what Jesus would have done. That's what he would have done. So what do you got to do? You got to share your faith. You got to be a witness. You got to start. If that's not the case, then you bring people to church. Drag them if necessary. Because you know what? I want you to know this. That sharing your faith is one of the greatest experiences that are, that are believer can experience it's it listen if the bible says that heaven rejoices when one soul comes to christ that heaven throws a party it's an also it's also a great experience for you as a believer i remember as a youth pastor having the opportunity to lead young people to the lord and watching as tears came down their face and you can't help but to weep with them to know that I was experiencing a miracle. That one moment they were on their way to hell. But because I contended with them and the Spirit of God convicted them. Now they made that decision and they're on their way to heaven. Their destiny has changed. Their life has changed. And you know, many of them today, I'm still in contact with. They're serving the Lord. They're married. They've done some great things with their lives. Had I not stood in the gap between hell and them, where would they be today? And you got to understand that God has called you. How do I know that? We like to put it on the pastor. Well, let the pastor do all. No. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that God gave these gifts to the church. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. What for? For the equipping of the saints so that they can do the work of the ministry. Who's a minister? You. My job is to equip you. So my job is to make you feel uncomfortable if you're not sharing your faith with somebody. It's time that we begin to realize and recognize that it's not enough to just come to church. We have to be the church. So we have to fish for men. So last week I gave you the foundation. Today, today I'm going to be a little bit more practical. I want to give you some wisdom tidbits. I want to give you some tidbits, some wisdom that we need. And I want you to go with me in the book of Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. I'm going to give you a little Old Testament and New Testament. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Now, I want to stop for a moment there because what it's saying is basically that the produce of a righteous person, okay? Now, what does righteous mean? Does righteous mean you got it all together? Does righteous mean that you are perfect? No, it does not say that. Righteousness means basically that my righteousness is as filthy rags, but I've received the righteousness of Jesus. So even though my life isn't all together, I'm walking in the righteousness of Jesus. And what does it say? It says that I'm a tree of life. What is a tree of life? Think about a tree. A tree has tall and it has leaves. So what does it do? It provides shade for someone else who might be dealing with something difficult. It provides fruit to somebody else that might be hungry. So it says the righteous is a tree of life. And look what it says. And he who wins souls is wise. So if you feel that you're categorizing yourself as dumb as rocks, then you start winning souls, you'll be wise. That's what the Bible says. You'll be wise. This is what it says. You'll be wise. And I'll give you the New Testament version. It's Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. It says, be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Well, who are outsiders? People that, people that don't believe. It's real simple. People that don't believe. Someone that's not a believer. It says, make the most. It's telling us, be wise in how we act towards them. 
Isn't it interesting that a specific group of people said that they were doing things in the name of God where they act? I won't go there. But anyways, right? It says, be wise in how we act towards God, towards outsiders. Make the most of every, make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace. In other words, you don't have to talk about or argue about who's right and who's wrong and whether it's pre-trib or post-trib. Makes me sick. Just simple. Don't argue. Just listen. Full of grace, right? Seasoned with salt. Why? Why? Make it taste good, right? So that you may know how to answer everyone because you're going to have to give an answer to someone, right? You have to answer. So I want to give you three areas, folks, that I believe that we need to be a little wiser in our approach with people. We need to be wise. How do we talk to people? Because guess what? We all need a little wisdom, right? We did. We did. So like, for example, fishing wisdom. You don't get on the boat and stand up and start rocking it. You don't just throw any bait out. You have to know what you're doing, right? Fishing wisdom. So I want to give you some fishing for men wisdom. And the first one is this. We need to be wise in our moment. We need to be wise in our moment. I want you to understand how amazing our God is. There are over 7 billion people on this planet. But yet God is in the middle of all of it, orchestrating intersections between you and people so that he can expand his kingdom. God is about divine connections. People that you pass by every single day, people that by the cubicle, at, at the store, wherever. God is orchestrating how he does it. He's like, you know what, at 3 o'clock I'm going to have Denise come by and at, at the same time I'm going to have... And it, he just does it that way because he's like, I care about that girl and this girl carries the presence of God and if she'll just get him, he orchestrates divine connections. I'm not saying that every connection is divine, all right? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that God does that. And so maybe you need to be a little bit more aware of it, okay? And some of you think, you know, for example, those of you that go to this church, you think that you're here by coincidence in this city? No, God brought you here. You need to keep that in mind. God brought you from wherever you were, brought you here. And God put them here. You think that you had your job by chance? No, God put you there. What for? Wake up and say, okay, God, let me be receptive to what you're doing. God's about making kingdom connections. So Psalm 37 verse 23 says this. And listen, I know some of you right now, you're sitting down, you're thinking, if he only knew who I work with. <laughs> you're saying, because I can't stand her. <laughs> I know. God put you there. God put you there. And you're, you're, you're like, I know you're going through the scenarios in your mind, but this, God put you there. Don't ever forget it. Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. So you thought, you know, you were doing, God says, no, I'm, Ordering your steps. <laughs> I know you meant to go that way, but I need you to go this way. I've got, so God, he loves me. So what if we were more aware of connections? What if we woke up and we said, God, is, is this one? If you go to the store, say, God, is this one? Because perhaps maybe God will speak to you and say, that's one. And whenever God says that's one, it's because God's already prepared the ground for you. You got to just, just beware, okay? So let me give you three little things underneath how to be wise, three little tidbits under wise, how to be wiser in our moments, okay, that God created. Number one is be intentional in every relationship. Be intentional, okay? Because perhaps what if God, what if God is the author of that connection? We got to be, uh, be a little bit more intentional with people when we connect with everyday life, even the people that get on your nerves, I know it's tough. I got some of those people I want to avoid. Come on, you know, in, in, the next, in, in October, I'm doing a series on how to deal with difficult people. You might want to miss that one. But, but, but I, listen, I'm, what I'm trying to help you understand is that God put you there for a reason. And if you're the salt and the, which makes it taste better and the light which brings light in the darkness, why he put you there then? Why? John Maxwell, he recently was speaking to some pastors about being more proactive in reaching uh, lost people because the truth is that pastors, we do a good job up here equipping you, but pastors really aren't that one-on-one -on -one out there as much as you think. 
And so he said to these pastors, he says, I want you to make a list. He goes, I have a list of 10 people that I interact with all the time that I'm praying for. And so I want to challenge you. I've got four people on my list. I'm not at 10 yet. I've got four people. I want to challenge you, even now where you're sitting, make a list. Who are the people that you need to be more intentional with that you need to be praying about? Make a list, I, I, I promise you. Here's another little tidbit. Find what matters to them. Because every person in life has something that's valuable to them, right? Whether it's their marriage or their kids or if it's a hobby, different things. You don't have to be in some deep theological conversation about the end times. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can simply talk about, hey, tell me about your kids. You watch them light up. Hey, tell me about this. They start to open up. It's amazing. If you find what matters to them and talk about it, it, it'll, it'll open up a door. I'll share with you. Bob, Bobby and April. April, wait, there's, there's April. Bobby and April were our neighbors when we first moved to Florida. And Bobby was in the car. Bobby would fix cars and lawn and stuff. I would, we'd always see him outside. And my dad, who makes friends with everyone, would go on over and see Bobby and talk to Bobby and whatever. So one day, Bobby says to me, hey, I heard you guys are starting a church. And I said, yeah, we're starting a church. And he says, well, we, we want to come. And they actually were the first people to come to our church. And thank God they're still with us today. <laughs> but because my father found something that mattered to him and talked to him about it. He didn't come over there and said, uh, listen, you need to come to church because if not, you're going to go to hell. And found what mattered and talked to him about it. Amen. Here's, a, here's, one, here's one little last one on that is add value to them. All right. In other words, find what their needs are and meet them. Abraham Maslow in the, in the early 1900s came up with this theory called the hierarchy of needs theory, which he demonstrates eight basic needs that as human beings we all need, like our need to live, our need to breathe air, our need to eat water, think, drink water, I'm sorry. All these basic needs, and they're broken up into three. You can study those on your own, but here's the deal. He basically states that we all have eight basic needs in life, and we behave or live our lives based on those needs. So here, here's the deal, physiological needs. Let me help you with those. You have a need to eat. You have a need to stay alive. You need a place to live. If you know somebody that is hungry or homeless, you don't bring Jesus to them first. Feed them and then introduce Jesus to them. Like, well, we, I'm going to pray for you right now to get saved, get filled with the Holy Ghost. And their stomach is going, Argh. meet a need. Take them to McDonald's. You know, meet a need, somebody. I'll tell you a story. There was a young man by the name of Carlos Rodriguez. He is actually Marielle Santana's uh, cousin. When I was a youth pastor, he would come to our youth services, and I didn't know until afterwards that he was actually homeless. And so we would all partner up, all of us. We'd take turns as youth leaders driving him back, and I would remember t taking him back in the middle of winter in western New York. It was freezing cold, and he was sleeping in an abandoned home with no electricity, no power. And I would tell him, buddy, do you need anything? You, we, would buy, we would take turns buying him food and stuff. No, I'm okay, Pastor. I'm fine. And he would go and sleep there. Well, you know what? It wasn't long after that we, people in the church began to take notice of this kid. And they, somebody offered him a job. And so he got a job. And so he was still homeless, but he got a job. And then after being the job, somebody, uh, somebody else said, listen, we've got this place, this apartment we want to help you with. And they got him an apartment. And other people said, listen, I've got a bed and a sofa and you need this. And, we got, and I had a car that somebody gave me. And he was going to work on the bus faithful. And I said, you know what? I don't need this car. And I gave him my car. What did we do? We met a need. Today, this kid now is married, didn't have a, he did not have a high school education. He got his GED, he got his bachelor's degree, he's working on his master's, happily married, and they serve as group leaders at their church. Why? Meet a need and watch what God will do. We don't got to try to fix everything. Meet a need. And then when those needs are met, you, go on, you graduate to the next meet needs which is uh, love and affection needs because everybody has a need to be known and loved, right? And feel important and appreciated. And all those are centered around relationships when you start having relationships with people. But let me say this, the ultimate need of humans is centered around fulfillment. The ultimate need. Fulfillment need. Because everyone has a need to be significant. The truth is money can't buy it. Your career can't make it happen. Fulfillment only comes from God. It only comes from God. 
He's the only one that can give it to you. Why? Because he's the one that created you with a purpose. And if he's the one that created you with a purpose, when you come to him, then he reveals to you how to unveil the purpose. Only he can bring fulfillment. Here's the absolute truth. You can't ever be truly and totally fulfilled and leave God out of the process. It's impossible. That's why if you ever study very successful, driven people, what are they? They're driven. Because once they get a taste of success, they want more, right? And so what do they do? They'll strive for it. They'll work for it. They'll step over people to get it. They'll lose their marriage and family over it and never find it. Never find it. Because even though money buys a lot of things and makes you feel secure, it can't bring you fulfillment. Fulfillment comes from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, My work, my work, this is Paul speaking. He says, My work was to plant the seed in your hearts. That's what you're doing, planting seeds. You're a planter. I'm planting seeds. And Apollo's work was to water it. But it was God, not we, who made the garden grow in their hearts. You water. You, you plant the seed. Plant the seed. Here's the second area we need to be wise, and we need to be wise in our manners. Or in other words, wise in our approach. Now, I've got three kids, and my wife and I, I don't know how I get that. My wife and I, whenever we go somewhere, maybe you're the, this is you, we always give our kids the pep talk. Anybody? Yeah. You whacked up in there, so help me, Jesus. <laughs> right? Mind your manners. Right? Because I think that too many believers, we, don't, we forget our manners when it comes to sharing our faith with other people. But I give my kids the pep talk. They better be, they line up, be good, be model kids, look good. Because when we get home, I'm going to light you up. <laughs> because your manners will determine your effectiveness in fishing for people. Your manners, your manners. Matthew 5, I'm going to read out of, out of the Message Bible. It says this. It says, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning. That brings out the God flavors of this earth. I love that. Salt seasoning. It says, if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your youthfulness and will end up in the garbage. You're here to be the light to bring out the God colors in the world. Isn't that powerful? I was like, wow, I'm going to frame that. That's who we are. Then I read 16 in the NIV, verse 16. It says, in the same way. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So when the people see your manner, they will glorify God in heaven. Right? So how do we do this, Pastor? Well, here's, how, here's one of the ways that you could do this. Make things better and brighter. What does that mean? Well, let's see. Tomorrow's Monday. And everybody wants to go to, oh, my God, it's Monday. It's the eclipse. I'm going to go blind. <laughs> right? Everybody's judging. So you know how many you make things brighter? Not you. You get up early in the morning. You get your little cup of coffee. And you go and you bring in some donuts or some muffins or whatever. And you walk in all happy and smiley. And everybody else is like, well, what's wrong with you? I don't know, but I got donuts. And that makes things better and brighter. Simple. I'm not giving you deep theological stuff. You can do this. Simple. It's a simple fishing technique. It's called bait. <laughs> Here's another one. Here's another one. How about this one, church Christian folks? Understand their world. Here's why I say that. We as Christians want everyone to know our worldview. And they better know it. And so we're going to shove it down your throats. Well, I'm a believer. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Blah, blah, blah. Right? We, I get it. I understand. But the truth is that we live in a very toxic society with very strongly opinionated culture. And what you're doing is setting yourself up for an ugly argument. Right? You, so what you do is even if you don't agree with someone, okay, even if you don't agree with them, okay, what you got to do, you got to learn how to say, look, it's okay with having conversations with people and say, hey, tell me, tell me about why you're like that. Tell me, about, tell me your upgrade. Tell me why you've made that decision in your life. You don't have to make it all about, you know, tell me what, what brought you to that conclusion or that. But tell me. I want to know more about you. Let me tell you something. I, don't, I know a little bit about Hinduism, not a lot. 
And so I had the honor of hanging out with Shivani's kids who both were raised in a Hindu temple. And I said to the boys, I said, tell me about Hinduism. Tell me about the temple and stuff like that. And all just that conversation, just that opened the door for them to talk about God. And then I learned something else. I learned that Guyanese people love to eat roti. And if you don't know what roti is, you would have never had manna from heaven. So there you go. I'm having me some roti. Understand. Take the time to understand their world. Instead of trying to fix people, stop trying to fix people. Let God take care of it. You know, here's one. Hey, tell me what you think about God. Or, or tell, me, tell me what you think about church. You'll be amazed at how many people will respond to you and tell you their horror story of what they went through in a church. So what do you do? You just share your story. You plant the seed. Let the Holy Spirit water it. Let God fix the situation. Amen? Here's one more little tidbit. Show them unconditional love. This is a tough one for a lot of people. This is a tough one. Show them. Which means it's love them even if they don't change their mind. Love them without reservation. Love them if they don't even agree with you. Just love them. Do you remember the story in the Bible? Zacchaeus was a little wee man in a tree. Right? All you people remember that Bible story? Yes. Jesus knew that this man spent, spent his entire life robbing from people. Taking. He was a thief. Jesus knew that. Jesus didn't come to the tree and say, hey, Zacchaeus, get down from there because you're about to burn in hell. He didn't say that. He said, hey, Zacchaeus. He said, let's go eat. Let's go eat. You like P.F. Chang's? I want to go eat something with you, right? You'll find the story in the book of Luke. I won't, the Bible doesn't go into detail as to what happened in that lunch, but something supernatural happened because the end result says that Zacchaeus decided to give back everything that he had taken to the poor, half of his riches to the poor, and then he said that if anybody he stole from, he'll give it back to them four times. Must have been a great lunch. Yes. Folks, sometimes you just need to say, hey, listen, let's go to lunch. Hey, listen, well, come to church with me. I'll take you to lunch, my treat. Oh, I'll cook for you. I don't, just fine, listen. Show them unconditional love. Show it to them. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. It says, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in his blessings. Come on, it's our job, folks. This is wisdom. God intersecting our lives with other people. So I'm giving you some wisdom to teach and reach people. Amen? And here's our last point that I want to share with you is we need wisdom. We also need to be wise in our message. We got to be wise in our message. And I'm going to share this one. I'm going to give you a little preview. I'm going to share this one next week. But I'm, let me give you the three points that I want to talk about. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 says, Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. That part gets me all the time. <laughs> and all the, if you've got difficult people in your life, say amen. <laughs> and this scripture's for you. All right. It says, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. It says, gently. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. It says, perhaps. But it says, be gentle. So let me give you a preview for next week, and it's real simple. Here's the three things I want to share with you. To share the hope that we have. Share the hope. What does that mean? Well, this is your opportunity where you can say, let me tell you why I became a Christian. Let me tell you my story. We all have a story. We do. We all have, I, have a, I grew up in church. I tell people I'm a recovering drug addict because my mom and dad drugged me to church. Right? But we all have a story. You have a story of why you became a Christian. They want to know. What was going on in your life? What made you make that decision? So share, share the hope we have. Here's the second one. Share your church. Share your church. Let me tell you something. This is not our desire. Our desire was never to be a church just for church people. 
It's not, I don't want to just see. I love you, but I don't want to always see you. It's not church people. Guess what? I want scores and scores of unchurched people that are far from God, that are hurting, angry, and confused coming through that door. But the truth is they'll only come if you invite them. You think a confused, angry person is going to walk in through the door? I just stumbled here. I don't know. No, they came because somebody invested time and said, come, would you come with me? That's what I want to see. And I hope that they, when they come, that they feel so welcome, so loved, that they'll say, look, I just want to call this place home. That's my desire. I want to play. So I'm asking every single one of you, listen, invite somebody to come. Start the conversation this week. Bring someone to church with you. And the truth is, here's where we got two big series coming up, September and August. One of them is uh, the one we got coming up in September. is called uh, You Asked For It. And basically that is stemming from Easter when we did a response card and we asked you, what are the things that you want to hear a message on? And surprisingly, a lot of people at the top of the list, Pastor, I want to know how I can hear the voice of God clearly. Another one is, how do I know my purpose, my call? But here's another one that's surprising. I want to know how to deal with difficult people. So we're going to be talking about those in September. Then October, we're going to do a series called Goliath Must Fall. We're going to talk to you about that later on. So, those are, so we have opportunities for you to bring your friends to church. Amen? And here's the truth. Keep this in mind. And hopefully this will help. Heaven and hell is real, folks. It's real. And every time that we talk to people, and we say we care and we love about them, you have to think about what's going to happen to them if they don't make a decision and give their life to Christ. Are you okay with that? It's real. And here's our last one. Our message is that we share Christ. We're going to share. I want to talk to you how you share Jesus. Because he's the only one that can take the sin away. He can only, well, he's the only one that can take guilt and shame away from people's lives. So next week, I want to talk about these and how do you do it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to be the great commission church that God called us to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me?